The topic is idiopathic hypertrophic subaortic stenosis, also known as IHSS. IHSS is a genetic disease characterized by marked hypertrophy of the left ventricle in the absence of chronic pressure overload. It tends to involve specifically the interventricular septum and consequently the left ventricular outflow tract. It's also called hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and is under the umbrella term for uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in young athletes in the US. It occurs about one in 500 people. Um, it's the most common genetic heart disease and it usually presents after puberty and the average age of uh, the mid 20s, but more and more we're seeing it in the 40s and 50s. The pathogenesis begins with a genetic abnormality of the muscle cell proteins. Uh, this is autosomal dominant uh, with variable penetrant, which means that not everyone who has the genetic mutation gets the same uh, presentation of the disease. Uh, most genes are for sarcomere proteins. Uh, the beta myosin heavy chain and the myosin binding protein C are the most common. Uh, most mutations lead to a single amino acid change, and this amino acid change uh, leads to what's called a myofibro disarray. The muscle cells are normally lined up linearly, but in IHSS, the muscle fibers, um, because of this mutation, are in disarray, i.e. they're in all different types of directions. Uh, these abnormalities uh, do not allow the heart to muscle to contract properly, and because of this, the heart compensates and um, hypertrophies, which means that the heart cells become bigger. Now, distinctive of this disease is that the interventricular septum becomes, becomes asymmetrically enlarged. Uh, the papillary muscles and the mitral valve uh, are also deformed by this thickened, sep thickened septum, and the thickening of the mitral valve leaflet can also occur. As you can see here on the left, the normal heart is uh, not hypertrophied. On the, on the right, uh, you can see a hypertrophy of the interventricular septum and the wall of the heart as well. And now this hypertrophy can result in two major problems. Uh, since the walls of the ventricle have now become bigger, there is less space within the heart chamber in the left ventricle to allow for filling of the heart uh, during diastole. And, and thus, the heart cannot uh, pump as much blood for, uh, during systole. Uh, so this is termed uh, diastolic heart failure. The thickening of the interventricular septum can also result, result in an intermittent outflow tract obstruction. Uh, this occurs because of um, an effect called the Venturi effect, in which as blood uh, passes through a narrow opening, the, uh, these Venturi forces tend to pull the uh, anterior mitral valve leaflet closer to the interventricular septum, thus resulting in obstruction. Uh, this is also called systolic anterior movement of the mitral valve, abbreviated as SAM. It is intermittent because it is dependent on how hard the heart muscle is working. If someone with this disease is exercising really hard and the heart rate is really fast, the diastolic period, uh, i.e. the time when the heart fills with blood, is shorter so there was even less time for the ventricle to fill. Since there was less blood in the ventricle, the outflow tract becomes narrower uh, because it is not able to be spread apart by the blood inside of the heart, and thus uh, you get more obstruction. These venturi forces are acting even stronger when the outflow tract is narrower. Uh, on the other hand, when the heart rate is slower, then there's more time for diastolic filling and thus less outflow tract obstruction. The diagnosis, um, the, the history and the physical, most patients have few or no symptoms. If a patient is symptomatic, he or she may have the following symptoms. Uh, dyspnea is actually the most common symptom, and this is due to that diastolic dysfunction that I spoke of earlier. Blood blacks up into the lungs because it cannot enter the chamber of the hypertrophy left ventricle, and this causes fluid overload in the lungs and consequently a shortness of breath. Palpitations can occur uh, from arrhythmias that occur in IHSS due to the, um, in a, in, the improper conduction system in the heart uh, because there is this myofibril disarray uh, 
within the heart muscle itself. Uh, angina is another common symptom, and this is due to the uh, hypertrophied muscle of the heart um, leading to more oxygen demand, and thus um, this experience of angina, especially during uh, exertion. Orthopnea uh, can also be occur in IHSS, and this is due to a combination of the uh, diastolic dysfunction and the subendocardial ischemia that occurs. Uh, dizziness is due to this outflow tract obstruction that uh, prevents uh, as much blood flow to the brain, and syncope and sudden death are due to arrhythmias that are caused by this uh, fibrosis and myofibro disarray that occurs in the disease. Uh, for physical exam, a murmur is usually the first clinical manifestation of the disease. You will normally hear a systolic crescendo-decrescendo rejection murmur along the lower left sternal border that increases with a decrease in preload, uh, such as with valsalva or standing up, and decreases with an increase in preload, uh, such as with squatting. And this is because valsalva decreases the amount of blood in the heart during diastole, and thus um, there is more obstruction, and thus you hear uh, the murmur more strongly. Um, and, but when you squat, there's more re return of blood to the heart, and thus um, there, is less, there is more filling during diastole, and thus less obstruction during systole. Uh, you can also hear an S4 murmur due to the non-compliance of the left ventricle during diastole. You may also have an accompanying mitral regurgitation murmur from the systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. You may also feel for a double peak carotid pulse, also known as a biciferin's pulse. And this occurs due to a quick rise, then fall of blood flow uh, during systole. Uh, there's a fall of the blood flow due to the outflow tract obstruction. And as systole progresses, uh, the rest of the blood uh, in the heart is pumped forward and you, you feel a secondary rise of blood flow through the outflow tract. A jugular venous pulse reveals a prominent A wave caused by diminished right ventricular compliance secondary to a massive hypertrophy of the ventricular septum. Routine testing for the disease. Labs are usually normal but may have an elevated BMP. A chest x-ray is also usually normal but uh, the cardiac silhouette may be increased in size. On EKG, you can see left ventricular hypertrophy and a left atrial abnormality. Uh, you may also see a Wolf-Parkinson-White phenomenon with certain mutations, and you will also see uh, deep and broad Q waves and inferior and precordial lateral leaves because of this thickening of the interventricular septum. An echocardiogram will show an increased septum to LV wall thickness ratio greater than 1.5 to 1. Cardiac MRI is especially useful when echocardiogram is questionable. Uh, cardiac catheterization is the most accurate test to determine uh, the precise gradients across the outflow tract. Genetic testing can be used as a confirmatory test, as well as cardiac muscle biopsy, which will show a myofibril disarray. A treatment, uh, most uh, patients are asymptomatic, and uh, normally they don't have to do anything. Uh, they, should, they should be advised to avoid particularly strenuous activities or any situations that may decrease preload. Medications are used to relieve symptoms. Uh, beta blockers are cons or calcium channel blockers are used in order to allow to slow down the heart rate and allow for more diastolic filling, which will in turn uh, decrease the amount of obstruction that occurs during systole. Uh, antiarrhythmics like disopyramide and amiodarone can be used for the arrhythmias that arise in this disease. Now, if patients are refractory to these uh, medical therapies um, and have an outflow gradient of more than 50, surgery may be an option. Uh, what the surgery does is it removes a portion of the interventricular septum to uh, diminish the uh, amount of outflow tract obstruction. Alcohol septal ablation is an alternative to uh, surgery. Uh, there's less, it's less invasive and less complications. Um, what it does is uh, some alcohol is injected into one or more septal branches of the LAD. 
and it induces a controlled heart attack in which part of the septum involved with the alpha tract is infarcted and subsequently uh, this, this area contracts into a scar. Uh, for all intents and purposes, the uh, results of this uh, procedure is the same as removing a portion of the interventricular septum during surgery. Ventricular pacing is also used. Uh, indications for this would be a family history of sudden cardiac death, uh, wall thickness greater than 30, unexplained syncope, and a history of ventricular arrhythmias. A cardiac transplant is used for cases refractory to all treatments. Here's a cartoon depicting a cardiac transplant. And the natural course of IHSS is extremely variable, but in general the disease is progressive and there is usually a latency of three years between the discovery of a murmur and the manifestation of the first symptoms of the disease. Occasionally, symptoms will actually diminish or disappear spontaneously with the passage of time. Uh, of note, about 1% per year suffers sudden cardiac death. Here are the references for this talk. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation on IHSS.